Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Nell Pepper, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and Cabot Science Library, I am so pleased to introduce this virtual event with Simon Clark presenting his book, Firmament, The Hidden Science of Weather, Climate Change, and the Air That Surrounds Us, in conversation with Jordan Harrod. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talks series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. To learn more about our other upcoming events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter or check out the page harvard.com slash science for the science talks schedule. I'll also be host, uh, excuse me, I'll also be posting a link in the chat to our science research public lectures YouTube channel where you can view previous talks that you might have missed. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button on your screen and we will get through as many questions as time allows. This event also has closed captioning available depending on the version of Zoom that you are using. You may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase copies of Firmament on harvard.com. Your purchases make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore in Harvard Square. We thank you all so much for continuing to show up and tune in both in support of our authors in this series and of the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And lastly, as you likely have experienced in virtual gatherings such as these, technical issues may arise. Uh, we, of course, hope that they do not. But if they do, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now I am delighted to introduce our speakers. Simon Clark is a video maker and science communicator from Bath, UK. He finished his PhD in theoretical atmospheric physics at the University of Exeter, researching dynamical stratosphere troposphere coupling over the Arctic with Professor Mark Baldwin. Prior to this, he studied physics at St. Peter's College, University of Oxford, obtaining his master's degree and specializing in theoretical and atmospheric physics. Jordan Harrod is a PhD candidate in medical engineering and medical physics at the Harvard MIT Health Sciences and Technology Program. Her research focuses on applying neuromodulation to clinically relevant challenges using neurotechnology and machine learning to develop new tools for brain stimulation. Outside of the lab, she is an AI-focused science communicator on platforms including YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. They will be discussing Simon Clark's book, Firmament, The Hidden Science of Weather, Climate Change, and the Air That Surrounds Us. In Firmament, Clark introduces readers to atmospheric science from a tour of the atmosphere itself to those working in the field to help us understand climate change. Sunday Times praises the author's enthusiasm shines through every page of this captivating guide to our unpredictable weather. He serves up high drama in balloons, deep ice drilling in the Antarctic, and through it all, draws out the patterns in our seemingly chaotic weather and the science behind them with clarity and verve. I'm very pleased to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Simon and Jordan. Hello. Hi. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, if I can have my video back. Yes, uh, certainly. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. There we go. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, as, a, as a quick way of apologies before I start, as I already mentioned uh, to the uh, team beforehand, it is currently 10 p.m. here. So if I, I speak very softly, I'm not doing a Bob Ross impression. I'm trying not to make my, my wife up, who is next door. Um, so, And also, I've got a bit of a cold, so... Apologies if I just sound a little bit husky. Anyway, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, series. Uh, and it's it's frankly a little bit surreal, really. I still haven't quite got used to the idea of having written a book, let alone be able to talk about it to lots of fine people such as yourself. Um, I do have a brief presentation, just a couple of slides to show you with an idea of what the book is about and sort of how it came to be before I go into conversation with Jordan. Uh, so if I can share my screen. There we go. 
Okay, so starting off with a dad joke, apologies. Um, I'm not a dad as far as I know, but I've got the humor for it. Um, so the, the purpose of this presentation is to, yeah, create a little bit of atmosphere and talk about what the book is about. Um, and you've already heard the book is about the, the hidden science of the atmosphere. And if you were to ask me to pick one picture to summarize what that means and what the atmosphere is, I'm a big fan of this picture, which shows the space shuttle Endeavour uh, hanging amidst these layers of the atmosphere. This, this is a really beautiful representation of what I find, what I suppose my gateway drug to atmospheric science was, which was this idea that the atmosphere has these discrete layers on top of one another. You've got the troposphere in orange, above that, that sort of milky white layer, that's the stratosphere. And above that, you've got the mesosphere, which literally nobody cares about. And then above that, you've got the, uh, the last vestiges of the atmosphere in the thermosphere before you reach the vacuum of space. And I love this picture because it, it, it shows off that structure and it also shows how tenuous our grip, us as humans, our grip on this planet is and how thin the atmosphere is relative to the huge mass of the planet below and the tiny speck of humanity and the technology that we have developed uh, is within that entire system. So this is one way to describe the atmosphere in this multi-layered beautiful, because that's the other aspect about this picture is it's stonkingly beautiful. And I think that is also true of the atmospheric system itself. But this is only a kind of one dimensional representation of the atmosphere. And of course, it has beautiful motion in three dimensions. We now know after centuries of science and, uh, and and scholarly thought that the atmosphere consists of these cells that extend upwards by uh, yeah, about 10, 15 kilometers and then wrap around the entire planet, the Hadley cell, the feral cell and the polar cell. And between them at the surface, you have these consistent patterns of pressure and wind. And this modern picture of the atmosphere, as I said, is something that developed over centuries. It didn't just sort of appear overnight. And this um, development of the science was something that I found quite lacking in my education. So I um, studied uh, at the University of Oxford. That's a picture of me while I still had light behind my eyes. Uh, and that's the atmospheric physics department as part of the uh, physics department. And uh, whilst there, I did an amazing module on fluids, flows and complexity, which was what got me into this subject. And I went on to study things like geostrophic flow, this basic idea of how you can take the f equations of fluid mechanics and apply them to the atmosphere on a rotating planet. And, you know, amazing bits of maths and science and chemistry and dynamics. But what was lacking was any context for where that science came from. Who did this? How do we know? Know what we know about the atmosphere. And so a couple of years ago, I was presented with the opportunity, would I be interested in writing a book? And I had this project in mind right from the get-go, this project of Firmament being that book that I wish I could have read when I was an undergraduate student, uh, the book that I wish that high school students could have read that would have got them interested in this field uh, and would have made them want to study physics and atmospheric physics at university. So this was always conceived as being uh, an introductory book and also a book that was always meant to be for me or the younger version of me and the stuff that I thought was interesting. Um, the thesis statement, I suppose, that I had in mind, uh, I actually already said, which is the, asking the question, how do we know what we know? And answering that question, um, I, if I could draw, because this is public speaking, of course, it's going to be three uh, arguments. Um, the, the first thing that I hope people take away from this book, and I hope is clear from reading it, is that atmospheric science has this long history, going right the way back to the ancient Greeks, people like Aristotle, arguably the most influential meteorologist of all time. That's Robert Fitzroy next to him, the man who developed the idea of weather forecasting and published the world's first weather forecast in the Times in the 19th century. And um, this idea of uh, identifying these large structures in the atmosphere, that's the jet stream you can see at the bottom, something that has in one form or another been kind of known about since the time of the Vikings and was actually clearly identified in the middle of the Second World War by the Japanese. So that was that was one aspect of it. But connected to that history, it's not just about history, it's not just about science, it's identifying the data, the actual raw material, uh, the, the base currency of science. How do we, what data do we have on the atmosphere and how did we obtain it? And the history of how we actually obtain that data about the atmosphere is really the story of the science itself. And then lastly, at, at the end of the book, a point that I hope is, um, I, I, I get across clearly, is that this is not 
science, this is not physics that is unique to the earth. This is a set of equations, a set of chemistry that you can apply and has been applied very successfully to other planets and moons like Titan and Mars. And uh, very interesting research is being done already on the circulation of atmospheres around other stars, around exoplanets. And that's something that if I could, if I could, I suppose, write an entire extra book about, that would be a fascinating subject to delve into, but I didn't in this case. But to give you sort of a snapshot of two very interesting um, examples of this story, this development of knowledge, one of my favourite um, things in the book and something that I was actually able to see in person was this map um, from the middle of the 17th century. This was Halley's map of the trade winds. This was the first time that anybody had collated data on a global scale and taken, taken it and put it into map form. There's actually this... Um, charming quote from uh, uh, from Halley underneath talking about how, you know, in, in the language of the time, I drew a picture because it made the most sense. An idea that was completely revolutionary at the time, as was this idea of there being these consistent patterns in the atmosphere, something that we do take for granted now, the trade winds that actually bore a lot of global trade from the 15th century onwards. That's an example that is sort of notably historic, but the development of the atmosphere continues apace, and something that was actually only identified a handful of decades ago in the 1950s was the event that the, the, the category of event that I studied during my PhD. What you're looking at here is the wind field, that's what the lines are, and the colours are the temperature field over the uh, Arctic at about, I think this is uh, 10 hectopascal, so about 30 kilometers above the surface. Apologies that this is in sensible units. Um, you'll have to do a conversion to Fahrenheit in your head. At the top, that's basically room temperature. At the bottom, that's very, very, very cold, like colder than it's even been recently. Um, but if I play this animation, note the date on the top left. This was a phenomenon that was only identified, as I say, in the 50s, um, whereby the polar vortex, that's this big donor of air that you can see in the middle of the picture there over the Arctic, it normally just is happy spinning by itself. But then about five or six times a decade, this happens. And this huge gout of warming of uh, 70 or 80 degrees Celsius can occur in just a matter of days. And the very coherent, well-organized vortex tears itself apart into these daughter vortices. And then the stratosphere is left wide open. And what I was researching in my PhD was the aftermath these events have on our part of the atmosphere on the surface. And that was science that was only identified even more recently in the late 90s. And that was done by my supervisor, which is why I studied with him. So this isn't a static field. This is very much a field that continues to develop today. And of course, the other angle of discussing the atmosphere today is this idea of it being a critical time in the history of the atmosphere and the history of our understanding of the atmosphere. This is the, the decade, really, where we have a choice about the future trajectory of the composition and dynamics of our atmosphere. And what I wanted to do with Firmament as part of my mission statement of being the book that I wish I could have read was to provide a bridge between the two competing fields of information that most people have about the atmosphere, which is meteorology and weather prediction and climate. And I felt like there was this real lack of understanding of the physical system that connected those two things, because I think once you do have an understanding of the physical system of the atmosphere and those layers and those dynamics, it provides a whole new context for the understanding of climate change and the significance of what we are currently living through. And this, of course, was another motivating push for me to write the book about what I did when I did, because this is, without wishing to uh, sound hyperbolic, pretty much the most important thing that you can educate yourself about. I'm not joking when I say that we live in the most critical decade when it comes to decisions about the atmosphere and something, those decisions and that understanding of the atmosphere is something that I hope will be developed by the book. So thank you very much for your attention. If you'd like to check me out on socials, there's my um, various places you can do so. Like Jordan, I'm also a, a YouTuber. Um, and speaking of, I will stop my screen share now. And I think um, we've got some uh, conversation to, to have, Jordan. Let me just stop the screen share. There we go. Here we go. <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for that great presentation. I really enjoyed reading your book, which I actually have a copy of here. 
Thank everyone you. should definitely buy it <laughs> if you haven't already. And I think one of the things there were there were many things in your book that I found interesting, both in terms of the information that you provide, but also in terms of how you chose to convey it. Um, and one thing that that did catch my eye, both in the book, but also in the presentation you gave was the emphasis and importance that you put on the history behind words. Um, there are many points in the book where you go back to Latin roots, you go through the history of particular terms as it relates to your work. And so I'm curious as to how you came to the title of the book, Firmament. Yeah, um, it, this may actually be the most common question I've had about the book, because it, as a title, it seems quite incongruous with the subject matter. Like it's a very... Um, particular word. Um, and the, the honest answer is that a huge influence of me writing the book was a book called Infinitesimal by Amir Alexander, uh, which was about the development of infinitesimal calculus in Italy and in England in the 15th and 16th and 17th centuries. And um, I just love that book so much that when I started writing Firmament, I didn't really have an, an authorial voice or a clear idea of what my version of a book would be. And so I started with what I liked and what I knew, which was that book. And something about the title, something about the, the nature of that word, it's like a it's like a dark chocolate word. You kind of want to pop infinitesimal or firmament into your mouth and just kind of like masticate for a couple of hours. Like it, it's, it's a delicious word. And I felt like, I don't know, I, I, I like, as you say, I, I like language and I find the development of it very interesting. And something about that just stuck with me. And I thought that felt like the right word and the right name for the whole project. No, that's awesome. Out of curiosity, were there any other words that you considered in the process? Well, you know what? So Firmament was a working title. The, the publisher asked me, you know, do you have a, a working title for this? And I think that had that that was rattling around my head and I I the, it just worked its way to my fingers and I said Firmament. Great. Okay, we've got a working title. And then I think they came up with a couple of other titles, like Under Pressure was another one uh, they were they were considering, which I'm I'm a big Queen fan, so I was, yeah, I was, I was just happy about with to that. say. Um, yes. but eventually, they just kept coming back to it, and I never actually seriously considered any other titles. Um, which is as uh, as we are both YouTubers, we know that the title is one of the most important bits of data you can associate with a project on YouTube. Uh, and it's probably the same for books, but just like with YouTube, I went, that's that's the right title. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to consider any other options. I don't know that I've ever had that particular experience with creating titles for YouTube videos, but I am happy that you did for this book. <laughs> Speaking of YouTube, actually, so you mentioned that this, this book was a project that you'd considered um, for a while before it was published last year. Um, and I suppose the, the concept of your book is something that I saw in your video, which I have up on my other screen, uh, where does the atmosphere stop, which may or may not have had a different title at the time. And so yes. I'm curious <laughs> as to when it came to this book, this, this message, the information that you were interested in conveying to the broader public was your original conception of this a video, like the video that you published, was it a book? Was it a 4,000 character Twitter post? Where, <laughs> what, what were you thinking when, when you wanted to, to send this message out to the, to the broader public? So I, I, when I was applying to universities, um, in, in the UK, you write something called a personal statement, which is, I can't remember how many words now, but it's, it's like a short essay saying why you find this subject interesting and why you want to study it. And if you study physics, like I did, there were certain books that you you just always said, I, I read Six Easy Pieces by Richard Feynman. Or if you're studying medicine, I, I read The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, whatever it is. And um, I had this realization sort of during the PhD that there isn't really anything like that for atmospheric science. And so this project in my mind was very much linked to the format of the book um, and what you know, it was too large to be a YouTube video. I wanted to spend much more time on it than I could ever possibly spend on a YouTube video or on a, a set of Twitter posts. I mean, I don't spend more than about five seconds on those. <laughs> um, but um, it, it, from, the, from the very beginning, the very conception of the project, it's what 
would I want to put into a book that was written for a personal statement, you know, to say, oh, I got really into, into atmospheric science because of this book. Um, and I kind of built the, the project and what went into the book around that concept. So I never considered the possibility of it being anything else, really. Well, that's amazing. And as a reminder to the audience, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A for the end of this talk. We will definitely be looking through them. Another question I had, so something that I personally love in terms of storytelling um, is, especially in nonfiction books, is, is focusing on the people behind the science. Mm. Um, that's something that I feel like, at least in nonfiction books that I've read in STEM, is often underrepresented. It's a lot more focused on the evolution of the science itself, as opposed to the weird, interesting quirks of the people behind it. And so I'd love to hear about what made you focus on the story and the human side of so many of these things um, and, and how that influenced how you wrote this book in the first place. Because th one of the things that I, I really loved about from it was hearing all of the stories behind all of the people who, who contributed to this work. So it's a really interesting sort of balance, I think, because the history of the history of anything and the history of science is no different isn't really a history of people it's a history of socioeconomic factors so for example the italian renaissance was kick-started by the fact that there was a huge amount of wealth that was brought over from the new world and it was put into some really wealthy families and they funded a bunch of interesting scholars and interesting art and science and whatnot um within that you then have interesting people like torricelli who invented the barometer or galileo or michelangelo or whoever and so when you're writing, when you're doing any kind of science communication, the problem with writing about systems is that systems aren't sexy. Like it's very difficult to make people care about, you know, gross macroeconomics or, or anything like that. Whereas as humans, we are drawn to people, you know, we're monkey brains. We are drawn to, to human faces and to human stories. So it's this balancing act between knowing that the history is really about these broad overarching themes and also knowing that if you talk about them you're probably going to bore your audience to death so to keep people with you and to illustrate you know a, a, an example of those historical factors like a, like a a cork bobbing on the tide i can't remember the exact john green quote um <laughs> but but you know to, to illustrate that point you focus on these individuals Quite where you go on that line, I think, depends on your audience. I think, generally speaking, if you're aiming for a, a low science capital audience, for quite a general audience, you want to rely on those individual stories. Whereas perhaps if you're writing for a more high science capital audience, um, if you're writing academically, for example, then, yeah, you basically just talk about the large factors. But... Um, so, so with that in mind, with, with the intended audience of this work, I tried to set out the table of this was the broad stuff in history that was happening. Um, but also within that table, here are some interesting plates and goblets, and these are the interesting people. Um, and I think there's an, another element to it of when I was researching, you can't help as a human being drawn into some of these people's stories uh, people like that i come back to several times james glacier who was this aeronaut in um 19th century england who was inadvertently one of the first people to enter the stratosphere but he had a very interesting personal journey through actually quite a crucial time in the development of atmospheric science in the middle of the 19th century and so he became like a touchstone because he had that interesting story that drew me and I kind of wanted to tell other people it. And then in some cases, it was these stories that were just not well known at all. Like, uh, James Kroll is the example that comes to mind, who is this Scottish climatologist who had this incredible life story of um, basically just having the worst string of bad luck imaginable. Uh, and then eventually working as a janitor at the University of Strathclyde and as part of his job cleaning the library and when he was in the library he would read the books and educated himself to the point where he was the world expert on climatology and glacial cycles um you know when i read something like that in a book I, you just kind of go come on like this isn't necessarily representative of the whole history at this time but that's an amazing story and i um i th I'm, I'm very much of the opinion that any kind of communication and, and especially science communication is just storytelling you've got to tell a story that your audience engages with and connects with and uh, one of the easiest and most effective ways to do that is to have these people at the root of it so you know the, the storyteller in me i suppose couldn't resist putting some of those those people in no i mean the storyteller in me loved it and actually speaking of james glacier and henry coxwell who found themselves uh, 
very up high in a hot air balloon and uh, at mortal peril. I'm curious as to whether or not you had any moments during your PhD that, you know, may not have been that high up in the air, <laughs> but certainly felt like mortal peril that you might want to talk about. I mean, the I had a period of 18 months where I had the code that had to work or my PhD would not just wasn't going to happen and every single day coming in and just beating my head against a wall <laughs> and just being like I don't know if I can do this um and you know that the moment of w working out what the problem was and then like the, the the dam bursting and suddenly all this progress happening was one of the most emotional moments of my life like I distinctly remember finding the problem going to the men's bathroom and just bawling my eyes out <laughs> because I was so happy um and so you know the I it wasn't quite the same as climbing out of a balloon at 20,000 feet but it was um <laughs> it, it, it felt similarly emotional <laughs> <laughs> no I feel like most people in their PhDs have had um, moments that feel like climbing out of a balloon at 20,000 feet, if, yeah. if not doing that. I hope that most of us have not. Well, I do. The thing is, I, in my cohort of people at Exeter, so Exeter has, has a huge climate program and an atmospheric program because it's where the UK Met Office is. Um, and there was basically a split between the people like me who were sat behind a desk and who were just analyzing data. So, you know, my PhD was on the polar. Uh, uh, stratosphere I never once went to the Arctic like I never had a chance to go and sample this stuff and then there was the other half of the cohort who were people who went and built instruments and for example one of my friends built an instrument that was designed to be flown through monsoon clouds in India and he got to go out there for you know experimental seasons and got to take that data and this felt really hard done by. <laughs> it felt like I chose the wrong project. And that was very exciting. So you've just got the, the desk nerds like me, and then you've got the people out there doing, you know, daring do and actually going out and collecting this information. And there's a part of me that really longs to do that kind of stuff as well. Though I do, I do love programming and doing my data analysis. I won't lie. I mean, I, I think that especially putting yourself out there on platforms like YouTube is also its own daring expedition of sorts. And so on that note, I'm I'm distancing a, a little bit from your book. I'm I'm curious as to how you decide what medium to science communicate in. So you have mm. this book that you published, which I have here, which I can also see in your background, which everyone should definitely pick up a copy of. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have your YouTube channel, you have your Twitch streaming. How do you decide what goes where, what story makes sense in, in what format? Yeah, that's, it's, it's the fundamental question of SciComm, really. Um, so I, I'm of the opinion that whenever you conceive a project, there are basically three things that you have to ask yourself, which is, and this is the influence of my, my wife, who's a teacher, I think. Firstly, what are your learning objectives? You know, what are the one to two or three things that you want your audience to come away with an understanding or an appreciation or the ability to form an opinion on. And then secondly, who are you trying to reach? There is the, one of the biggest cons you'll ever internalize is this idea of a general audience. There is no such thing as a general audience. You have to be very specific in terms of the demographic that you are reaching, which could be age or interest or gender or, or, or geography, whatever it is. And once you have an answer to those two questions, the third factor is the format that you choose. and when you're someone like, like us who regularly makes YouTube videos, that actually means that that third peg in the ground is sorted first and you kind of know your audience and so you're just free to pick your learning objectives. Whereas if you're starting from a blank slate, if you know what you want to get across, what information you want to get across and who you're trying to reach, which was the case with Firm, and I knew those two things, then the choice of format makes itself. So the fact that I wanted to make this uh, quite an in-depth book that was an introduction to this field and gave people this, this metadata and this context, and I was aiming for that sort of high school student, undergraduate student, naturally it lent itself to a book. Whereas when I do stuff on Twitch, for example, a series that I haven't done for a little while now, but I'd like to come back to is in the same way that people play through video games on Twitch, I would go through physics and maths exam papers and have me in the top corner and have like a top-down camera of me writing on pencil and paper. And the reason I chose that format was because my learning objectives were, let's try and help 
students who are preparing for these exams and do so in a way uh, using a format that they currently use for just for fun and in, a, and in, a, in an environment that they find relaxed and that naturally narrowed down the choice of format to live streaming like the the nature of what I was trying to accomplish lent itself to that format so I feel like you know, in any project, there's those three pieces of information, and just normally you'll have two pieces, and the the, the last one will just write itself. Um, and I've been very lucky and perhaps over ambitious in that I've been able to do <laughs> this in a podcast and in uh, and in a book and in uh, YouTube videos and in live talks. And you know, it's it's something that I the more that I do it and the more that I do it in different formats, the more I see how that general approach is true for for, for every format. Absolutely. And I mean, I would argue that your success on in all these different ventures is is proof that it hasn't been over ambitious for you. <laughs> I am curious. I love footnotes and books mm. and you have many of them. And so I'm curious as to how many of the footnotes that ended up in the final draft. I suppose how many were there originally <laughs> and how many were in the final copy? So there were more. Um, <laughs> there were two things that held me back. The first of which was, I, I actually already mentioned him, uh, Oliver Sacks, he wrote the, the Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, and I'm currently reading Musicophilia, which is amazing. I find his books really frustrating to read sometimes, though, because he has a footnote about every other page. And um, one of the most useful things, I mean, this is across no matter what format you're working in, I think one of the most useful things you can do if you're going to work in a format is to work out what you don't want to do. And when I was preparing to write the book, I read quite a broad range of Psycom. And in that, there was stuff that I knew I wanted to emulate, like Infinitesimal. But there were also books that I knew that I didn't want to emulate, and I didn't want to do this kind of thing. And The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat taught me, actually, I don't want there to be that many footnotes, um, which was definitely a pull against me wanting to put in more etymologies. There were more dad jokes in the original version as well. <laughs> like, there, there were a lot more. There was a terrible joke about um, Heinrich Hertz and his name cropping up really frequently. Um, like, there were, there, were, there were a lot more of just, just terrible jokes. And I think in the editing process, they were like, actually, if you take this one out, we can just, we can cut this by like a whole page. <laughs> Um, I was like, okay, fine. Um, the one that I really had to stand my ground on was the uh, explaining uh, the primitive equations that I put in. Mm -hmm. well, primitive, because they're, if you look at them and you're not from the field, they look yep. horrible. Um, but I was like, no, that has to have this big footnote that explains what you're looking at. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the other thing that pulled me back from doing it as well was I, uh, my second supervisor during my PhD had very strong opinions about most things. But one of the things he had very strong opinions about were footnotes. And he was like, footnotes are an abomination and need to be destroyed. Oh. And whenever I was sort of on the fence about putting something out, I would hear that in the back of my head. And I was like, okay, yeah, David, I'll just take that <laughs> I don't know that either of my advisors had that strong of an opinion on footnotes but both of my supervisors had very strong opinions on typography as well which was very like I remember when I printed out my final version of the thesis and I gave it to my first supervisor the first thing he looked was like with a like a jeweler's mm -hmm. glass at the printout and was like is that mm -hmm. an m dash or an n dash yeah or is that a hyphen and I was like I, I don't know. What do you think of the science? <laughs> like... No, I, I literally just looked over because I thought I had a ruler on my desk. I, I did have an advisor who, when I sent a final copy of a thesis that I wrote, like got out a ruler and was like, how big are these margins? <laughs> I was like, what do you think of Does the work I've been doing for the last two years? He was like, but the mark, it's fine. <laughs> Welcome to academia. It's great. So, um, I tell you what, if you want to note that the, the wildest sort of typography formatting thing, when absolutely. I wrote my master's thesis, Ox Oxford University is weird at the best of times. But when you write your master's thesis in physics, they don't have a word limit and they don't have a page limit. At least this was when I wrote my thesis. Their master's thesis requirement was an area. They would tell you you could have so many square, I can't even, it might have been square inches or it might have been square centimeters. And it was like, this approximates to like 13.6 pages of A4. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, has someone turned in like a scroll <laughs> at some point? I am, I'm stressed on behalf of anyone who has to do that because that's just not like, I thought for, for anyone in the US who has to apply for um, the National Science Foundation's Graduate Research Fellowship Program, they also have very stringent um, 
text and formatting and margin rules and you get auto rejected if you don't conform to all of them. Uh, but if they if they had a rule about how many square inches of text my proposal needed to take on a page, I would drop out of my PhD. I'd be done. <laughs> it wouldn't be worth it. <laughs> wouldn't blame you. <laughs> so another thing that I was curious about, actually something that you you've mentioned a few times, um, is that you read other other books in kind of the science communication STEM nonfiction realm. And so I'm curious as to whether there are books that come to mind that really inspired or contributed to this work. So yeah, I've already mentioned um, Infinitesimal by um, Alexander. That was probably the most influential. Um, I made the mistake of reading The Emperor of All Maladies whilst mm. I was writing the book. And and you're like, oh, this is the author's first book. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what a first book to compare yourself to. I was like, well, what's the point? <laughs> What's, what's the point of me trying to write now? Um, but, you know, so that was good. And like, it was an aspirational one to look forward to. But also like in terms of um, in terms of length and the depth that you go into a subject, like nobody wants an introductory book. The, the, the whole point of it is to just dip your toe and make you interested in, a, in a, an area. Nobody wants that to be a brick that's 500 or 600 pages long. And so actually reading a big book like that was definitely useful to go, OK, well, this is I don't need to do this. I actually want something that's about half the size of this kind of thing. Um, behind me, I mean, behind me on my set for all my videos is uh, half of the books that I find particularly influential. Um, another one that was really uh perhaps not a direct influence but definitely a style guide was the strangest man by graham farmello um which is a biography of paul dirac who's one of the most uh, amazing physicists i'm a little biased because he's from bristol which is just down the road um uh but but that was that along with um uh, sapiens by yuval noah harari were definitely sort of style guides for tone uh and the level of complexity that i wanted to go into and if you're explaining a complicated concept how do you ease into that um i'm gonna check behind me again in case i'm forgetting something <laughs> really important um oh yeah um a brief history of medicine by paul stratham that was another mm -hmm. one that i read when i was in school i was very lucky in, um when i was in GCSE year so what I was middle school I guess um uh, in that we did a whole year in our history class on the history of medicine from neolithic times to modern day and that was a book that I read alongside that course and that was another very big style guide for what I wanted to do with this project the other as, as I already said as well though what I didn't want to do was also very um important to me and I think much more instructive like I always tell people if you want to learn how to make a YouTube video or a film don't watch the really good stuff because craft is invisible, but mistakes are very obvious. So if you want to learn how to make a film, don't watch The Godfather or The Return of the King or Chicken Run. Watch like The Room or Yesterday <laughs> or oh, God. Breaking Dawn or whatever. Like, you know, th th that's going to teach you more. And for me, um, there was uh, a, a book called, oh, it's so terrible, I've actually blocked it from my name, uh, Lucky Planet by David Waltham, um, which I just found annoyingly chummy. And mm. from a tone perspective, again, I was like, okay, well, I know I don't want to do that. And also The Secret Life of Trees, which is a very popular book, um, but I knew that I didn't want to do chapters that short. I didn't want to have that really self-contained, start-stoppy kind of structure. Um, so, you know, the, the, the style guy came from both ends of like a, a carrot, I suppose, what I was striving towards and a stick in mm -hmm. terms of what I was trying to avoid. I completely forgot the movie The Room Existed and now I can't get it out of my head. But Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. But also thank you for all the book recommendations that I will definitely need to follow up on. So my last question before we turn it over uh, to the Q&A is a bit of a fun one, I suppose. So there are several parts in your book where you um, provide recommendations for how one might achieve athletic pursuits with the knowledge that they've gained from your book, whether it be pursuing Olympic records at a particular latitude or running faster in order to lose weight. Are there other recommendations that you might have for people to <laughs> impart in their daily lives based on reading this book? I think 
I mean, that's a great question. Um, the the, <laughs> the, the, the Erzbusch effect, which is the, uh, if you're running east, you weigh less, basically, um, which is the, the, the exactly the same idea as the Coriolis deflection. It's just in the other direction. Um, it was one of the things I really wanted to get in, in there because I just feel like if you know, it's useless. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's not like there's a hack, like, you know, doctors hate him. There's one simple hack will make you weigh less. Like if it was easy, everyone would do it. And the, the, you know, there are no, um, easy things that you can do in order to like uh you know become a better athlete or whatever i think if you're going to take anything away in terms of like you know where should i do something or what what can i exploit in order to make the most of this if you take anything away it's that it needs to take place in a really tiny band <laughs> of the atmosphere like once you get more than you know a, literally a couple of kilometers above the surface suddenly everything just stops being easy and you know and everything is hostile to human life and this idea that like if you if, if you have a globe and you and you paint a coat of gloss varnish on it that's coat of varnish is actually thicker than the habitable section of the atmosphere like it shows just how tenuous the places where you can even attempt to do those things let alone be you know better at them uh, just how tenuous our place is um and you know how at the mercy of this huge system we are so you know the, there are these cool ones in the book but i think that's actually the takeaway for me is that um yeah <laughs> wherever you, wherever you're gonna do it be careful absolutely that is definitely something that everyone should take away i am taking that away now as i uh cancel the run that i have planned for tomorrow morning in order to lose 20 pounds by running <laughs> so fast that the force of gravity lessened on me so that's my mistake <laughs> But now we'll turn it over to the audience Q and A. Uh, I see that we have a bunch of amazing questions, and I'm sure it will be great to cover them. All right. Thank you so much uh, for that great conversation. And yes, we have a good crop of questions here. I'm going to start by kind of combining. Uh, two of them. Um, uh, they're both kind of more uh, general questions about the book itself. So uh, Chris Turnbull asks, as someone who knows little about atmospheric science, how difficult would it be to understand your book? And um, Martine uh, Vore asks, uh, in addition, she's just curious to, to hear more about like the, the, the topics within the book, sort of how what you go into. Sure. So um, the book is very much designed to be non-technical. Uh, that there's, I think it's Stephen Hawking who said that for every time you put an equation into a book, you halve its readership. Um, and so with that in mind, this is very much a, a, an introduction with a couple of equations. There are a few, um, but you you certainly don't need any kind of college or high school background in, in science in order to, to get it. Um, in terms of what I do talk about, um, there's, in terms of the, putting the history to one side, what I talk about is thermodynamics, which is to say how energy enters and leaves a system and how that affects the temperature of that system, which is something that you can do for an entire planet. You can work out what temperature a planet should be, but you can also do for parcels of air within the atmosphere. And depending on the answer you get, that will change how those parcels behave. And the dynamics, that question of the physics, the equations that describe how those air parcels move around on a rotating spherical planet um, is sort of the, the part of the atmosphere that I find most interesting and the part that I go into probably the most detail on. So there's that, which is in the context of uh, meteorology and weather prediction and you know why the air behaves the way it does around you. But also I do I dedicate a chapter to the polar vortex, which was mm -hmm. what I showed you in the presentation and you heard about probably recently in the news frequently misused as a phrase, um, but uh, is very important when it comes to weather in the mid latitudes, so both North America and Western Europe. Um, so I, I kind of allow myself to luxuriate in my pet favorite part of the atmosphere. I mean, it's just the coolest bit. Um, and then uh, lastly, with, with sort of all the context that's developed scientific and historical over the book, then there is a chapter at the end uh, on about climate, how it changes, how we 
figured this stuff out and how we figured the climate changed in the past and what we think it's going to do in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but as I said earlier, the, the idea is to give you that scientific context to bridge the gap between the weather prediction side and the uh, climate side. Okay, thank you. Um, and actually, uh, jumping right off of what you just said, we have an anonymous attendee who asks, I, I feel like this question just sort of haunts me a bit too after hearing uh, your talk. Um, someone asking, why, uh, why are otherwise seemingly simple weather forecasts, or at least at the simple way that they appear on American television, why are they so often inaccurate? Um, if these meteorologists are so mod obsessed with the computer modeling and so on, um, why why does it so often why does it so often not do what they say it's going to do? <laughs> yeah, uh, and it's a fair question um, because I think that is that if your principal way that you interact with atmospheric science is weather forecast and weather forecasts, and you see that they are wrong seemingly most of the time, then it's entirely fair to question quite why this field exists and people study it. Um, the reason that weather is frequently predicted to be incorrect is because predicting the weather is really hard. Um, specifically, the atmosphere is an example of a chaotic system. So a chaotic mm -hmm. system is any system where you have really complicated dynamics all layered on top of one another. And if you are if you're perfectly sure about the dynamics of that system and where you start in that system, then you can predict what's going to happen into the future. And the classic example of this is if you have a, a pendulum, it will it will mm -hmm. swing in a very, very predictable way. If you know the starting position, you know the dynamics, you're cushy. But if you take another pendulum and attach it to that first one in a double pendulum, even if you are almost certain about the exact position of those two pendulums in relation to each other and how fast they're going and you know what the equations are even a tiny uncertainty in that initial position will translate to a huge error not very far into the future mm. um and the atmosphere is like a bunch of double pendulums stacked on top of each other that are then attached to another enormous double pendulum uh it's just the most incredible chaotic system and when you consider that the inputs to these these, these weather prediction models are temperature fields and pressure and humidity over huge areas with uh like any instrument with error bars we don't know if it's exactly 19.2 fahrenheit or it could be 19.21 or 19.19 there's a tiny uncertainty absolutely everywhere and yet despite that we are able to predict about a week into the future a week to 10 days maybe two weeks depending on where you are in the world you can predict what's going to happen into the future before the errors start to just become ungovernable mm -hmm. and that is actually the remarkable um the idea that you can even do it at all was considered to be impossible until about 150 years ago um and then the idea of doing it with computers only started about 70 years ago so um it, it's a field that is actually comparatively young and is remarkably good considering that and considering the complexity <laughs> of the system it's dealing with i'm not just making excuses it is um, unfortunately a mathematical property of the atmosphere that we're trying <laughs> to fight against <laughs> thank you um uh, we have a question uh, from uh, Donald Nicholas asking, what is the significance of the surface station project, which is not something that I'm familiar with. So I thought I'd ask if you were familiar with it. <laughs> uh, I don't believe that I am familiar with it. Surface station. Um... Uh, sorry, I'm just giving this a quick Google. So this sure, is... yeah, sorry. <laughs> but, but this is the, this is the great thing about this project. E even with um, you know, having done a master's degree and a PhD in this field, in writing the book, which is still introductory, there's so much stuff that I came across that I didn't know. You know, the, the depth of this field, considering it does go back millennia, it's maybe not surprising. But there are so many things that you you've never come across before, and so it was a learning experience for me, let alone for the for the reader. Um, <laughs> so uh, the surface station model. Uh, there's some ambiguity here on Google, so I'm not entirely sure what okay. this is referring yeah. to. So I can't give a proper answer to that. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's fine. Um, we have, let me see here. We have several science communication questions as well. Oh, okay. Here we go. Um, so uh, another anonymous attendee who asks, um, I feel like so much talk about climate change is focused on what we see on the ground with images of forest fires, deforestation, uh, droughts. Why does the atmosphere so often get left out of the conversation? And how do we get people to talk more about the atmosphere when discussing climate change? It's a good question. Um, 
and I, I suppose I suppose the obvious answer to, the, to to why we don't talk about the atmosphere is simply that we don't experience it. We experience the footprints of the atmosphere here on the ground, but actually the stuff that's going on in the air is it's a perfect problem from a science communication perspective because it's intangible. You can't feel it. You can't see it. It changes over long time scales. It's very difficult to make people care about it. Um, the best that we can do uh, as science communicators is to focus on those footprints, is, mm. is to focus on the things that are experienced as a result of the atmosphere. Um, you know, there are interesting discussions to be had. There are interesting conversations around, for example, one of the reasons that we are very confident that it's humans that are causing this recent change in temperatures is the fact that the upper atmosphere is cooling at the same time that the lower atmosphere is warming. There's a very specific anthropogenic fingerprint in the, the temperature change. Mm. And that's something that is almost entirely absent um, from sort of modern discussions of it. I would argue that actually the thing that we need to discuss more than the atmosphere, and this is from a guy who studied the atmosphere is actually the ocean um the, mm. the the impacts of the of climate change on the ocean in terms of acidity but also in terms of the heat uptake i can't give you an uh, exact figure off the top of my head but the oceans have absorbed the, ma the vast majority of all the excess heat that has been added to the earth system and at some point that's not going to be the case anymore and the atmosphere is going to start heating up much faster because the oceans have had enough and that is going to have a tremendous impact on marine biodiversity and on any system that involves the interaction of the atmosphere and the ocean. So despite the fact that this is, you know, that that's very much what I studied and what I think is the coolest thing in the world, I'd actually rather hear more discussions around ocean warming and the oceanic fingerprint of, mm. of climate change than the atmosphere. We have uh, another uh, a question from... Uh... Chris uh, Turnbull, who asks, why do you think atmospheric science is touched on so little at uh, GCSC or middle school in the U.S. or A-levels, high school in the U.S., education stages when it's so integral to life on Earth? Yeah, um, I wish that it was talked about more at a younger stage. Um, the reason that we don't talk about it more is because it's bloody hard. Um, <laughs> in, in order to have a, a model for how the atmosphere behaves even on the most basic level like the, the simplest equations that you can write for how the atmosphere changes um and and the, how the wind is connected to the pressure they involve partial derivatives which is something that mm. you do not cover until a, quite an advanced level of calculus in high school or a university even um and you know it, it, the problem is it's a even if you reduce it to a two-dimensional system, it's not two-dimensional. There are three dimensions to the atmosphere, but there are bits that are kind of two-dimensional. Even then, you're still dealing with relatively complicated maths. And it's not like you can reduce it to a one-dimensional system, because at that point, right. you're not really talking about anything. Um, so, th you know, the, the reason that we don't talk about it at a younger age is because fundamentally it involves partial derivatives it involves um rotational mechanics it involves physics it involves thermodynamics it's one of the more complicated basic subjects that you can try to introduce somebody to um and what i try to do in my videos and my, my general kind of outreach to younger audiences is to maybe focus on particular aspects of it to perhaps the level that you would cover at a, a high school or university level but be very limited in your scope but that then leaves you with the problem of instead of grasping a picture of the entire elephant, you're grasping its ears or its tail or one of its legs, and you don't actually have a picture of the whole atmosphere, but at least it's to start. And maybe over a longer period of time, you can piece together the whole atmosphere from those individual pieces, mm. but it's, it's really hard. <laughs> and we have uh, a fun question. Uh, anonymous attendee who asks, if you could witness any historical atmospheric event in person, what would you want to see? Ooh. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, if I could guarantee my safety. Um, so mm, the, the, the problem with a lot of the big historical events is that they happen really slowly. Um, so <laughs> the, the addition of oxygen to the Earth's atmosphere was a, a mm. tremendously violent uh, event. It was something that completely reshaped the, the biochemistry of the entire planet. It, according to some biologists, led to the development of multicellular life. Um, but it's not like there was a particular moment that you could travel to and go, that's that's where it happens. This is something that happened over about one and a half billion years. Um, so, you know, much as that would be cool, kind of the most momentous event you could go to, that right. would be fun. An individual event Maybe the eruption of 536, there was a, a 
colossal volcanic eruption that happened in 536 AD mm. that you see this fingerprint of in in histor in the historical record all over the world. Um, and if I could guarantee my safety to be near that when it exploded, okay. to have that global climatic impact, that mm -hmm. would be pretty cool. Okay, I was just the, the the one thing that I was thinking of that just again, like it actually you could pinpoint a time when it happened and like here's the cause and here's the effect. And the only thing I could think of is like the year without a summer. That's mm. really the only thing I could. But uh, yeah, volcano prompted. Yeah, yeah, and, and, <laughs> and that that happens every couple of hundred years. But I think five three six is the biggest one that we're aware of. Like mm. the, you see these temperature graphs throughout history, and there's just these suddenly there are these massive drops in temperature mm -hmm. so to, to be there at the start of any of those but sure if i can pick one let's pick the yeah biggest. the 536 okay <laughs> okay um and let me see here we have lots of questions i think we only have time for a couple more um all right daniel hanvey asks um an interesting one he says science communication books are pretty much exclusively non-fiction do you think that there is a place for science communication taking place in, uh, he says, purpose written fiction books, I suppose, maybe just mm. novels written about, uh, while minimizing the risk of fictional elements diluting the truth of the science being communicated? A really interesting idea, because uh, as we talked about before, science communication is storytelling. Um, mm -hmm. And it just so happens that the stories that we tell are true. Um, I definitely think you can communicate scientific ideas within a a broader structure. You do have that problem of, well, is this thing actually being correct or not? Um, uh, you know, to give an example just off the top of my head is I think a lot of people learned about orbital mechanics and about um, the geography of Mars from Andy Weir's The Martian. That is mm -hmm. a cracking piece of fiction. But within that, there is actually quite effective bits of science communication that are sort of buried and yeah so some stuff is wrong but that that's because the book wasn't approached as psychom it was approached as a story that you're going to base around science mm -hmm. um i definitely think it is possible um maybe that's a project i think dan dan Hanvey may have just given me another project to work on as if i needed another one <laughs> um may, i definitely it's a really interesting idea and now i'm thinking about how i could try and do it <laughs> And I think I'll, I'll close out with this question from Rachel Liu, who asks, do you have any advice you would give to STEM PhD students who are interested in science communication in their respective fields? Uh, she says, I'm super impressed by your span of knowledge and your ability to communicate it. I'm only a first year in my PhD program, and I feel incredibly daunted, and it feels impossible that I will one day be an expert mm. in this field. Everybody feels that way. Don't worry. Um, also, congrats and commiserations on being a PhD. It gets worse <laughs> and then it gets better. Um, so, so the, mo the, the the hardest piece of advice that I that I was ever given to take was also the truest, which is that in terms of making videos specifically, the first one hundred videos you make will suck, but that's okay and that's good because until you make a hundred bad videos, you can't make your first good one. Mm -hmm. And every single time that you, you start a project and you make something and you get something out that's imperfect, you have learned a lesson. And sometimes early on, it might be a huge lesson or it could be something really minor, but every single project that you make, you do that with, you get that little bit better. And each video will be unrecognizable to the version of you that understood the subject when you first started. Um, the, the version, I mean, it, I say 100, the first video of mine that went quite big on Reddit and sort of grew my channel to the point where I could start thinking about doing it full time, I think was my 211th video. So, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it takes longer than 100. Sometimes if you're really, if you're someone like Jordan, like sometimes it takes a lot less. Um, <laughs> but the fact is no one's first project <laughs> was, a, don't laugh. Uh, <laughs> like, that's not exactly true, but... <laughs> but... But nobody's first project was perfect. Um, you know, uh, Bach's first piece of music wasn't a masterpiece. You, you, and, you know, there are so many quotes about this. The pip, the, right. the master has, has failed more times than the amateur has, has tried, uh, all, that, all that kind of thing. Um, but the, the, the simple fact is you're going to suck at first. And as soon as you accept that fact and embrace it, and you just start making things, the sooner you will get to the point where you're able to make the things that you want to make. So just do it. Don't worry about wasting a good project. 
just just take your idea and make it and in the process of doing that you'll come up with two or three more ideas and do that and repeat and you will get to the point faster than you think where you'll be able to make things that you would never believe is are possible excellent i could jump in but I yes think just to add on that i would also say that it's fine to say that you don't know the answer to something when it comes yes. to making content um, when I started my channel, I started as a first year PhD student, and there were many times when I just didn't know the answer to something. And I often used it as, you know, if you know the answer to this, leave a comment down below, something like that. But it's it's totally fine to to make a video and not have all of the answers. I think three words the world needs to hear more of. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Truly. Truly. <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Simon and Jordan, uh, for this great conversation. And thanks to all of you for spending your evening with us. Uh, please uh, learn more about this uh, fascinating book and purchase copies of Firmament at harvard.com. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science and Cabot Science Library, thank you so much. Be well and have a good night. Happy reading. Bye-bye. Thank you.